Shalom and welcome again to another edition of Seekers of Meaning, the podcast arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. We welcome you and thank you very much for your time and joining us today. As you know, these podcasts are designed to explore some of the issues associated with the revolution in longevity that's taking place within our own community, our families, our congregations, and our organizations. Uh, if you'd like to contact me with uh, ideas or suggestions, please feel free to email me at rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. Visit our Facebook page, and um, we thank you for doing that. One of the in- engaging and challenging issues, of course, uh, within all of our families uh, that many of us deal with is uh, decision making and the ethics around end of life decision making. And to that end, we are Very honored to welcome back uh, for a return uh, to Seekers of Meeting, uh, Rabbi Jason Weiner of Los Angeles, spiritual care director uh, for one of the leading hospitals on the West Coast and author of a brand new book that should be coming out and available right now called Care and Covenant, uh, a Jewish ethic of responsibility. Uh, Jason, welcome. It's nice to see you. I hope you're well and safe with you and your family. Thank you. Likewise, great to be here with you. Uh, this is an amazing book. Uh, let me let me get right to this. Uh, if we have colleagues uh, who are watching or listening to this, or adult education chair people in congregations, uh, and you want to create an adult education program around um, issues of bioethics, contemporary issues, I really would suggest you getting a hold of this book. You can fashion a curriculum around it. I don't know whether. Jason, you're going to be doing a study guide around this. Just I don't want to give you more work to do because I'm sure you're very busy. Um, This is a magnificently researched book, uh, and uh, I congratulate you on it. In the beginning of this book, I think it's in the introduction, you write that this book, uh, this uh, uh, an ethic of responsibility, we're searching for meaningful values to help inform policies, practices, and policymaking. What, What does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you so much for your kind words. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, basically what it means is that m- much of when we talk about Jewish medical ethics, oftentimes we're talking about very sp- specific issues that patients face on an everyday basis, um, individual questions. In fact, Rabbi Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory once lamented in an article, he, he didn't write a lot about um, medical ethics, but he lamented that Jewish authors and thinkers weren't thinking enough about broader ethical, societal ethical issues. And he mentions in that footnote, he says, you know, even the medical ethics writing that we have is private issues between doctor and patient, individual decisions that that have to be made. And he kind of challenged his readers to think bigger and think, you know, what do Jewish values have to say to our society at large, whether it's on a government, you know, legal level, or whether it's on kind of hospital policymaking, or just kind of broader issues that we should be thinking about, that Jewish values do have a lot to say uh, with broader decisions that have to be made in in hospitals and in healthcare. And so my goal was to to move a little bit beyond the private decisions and discussions that patients have in hospitals and go a little bit further out to the kind of policymaking decisions as we create um, healthcare policy, hospital guidelines, and, and things that are affect the entire society. So would it be safe to say that um, this book is a book on practical ethics? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, my, my goal, yeah, it's not just to be um, you know, philosophical and kind of just playing with ideas. Everything I wrote about, we, I wrote about because there are issues that I face on a daily basis in the hospital, in, in the clinic, with patients on the front lines. Uh, and there meant, my goal was, you know, to help people and to make a difference in actual lives. So yeah, it's not, it's not theoretical. It's meant to be practical. So you, you write about this. Um, I think you, you channel a, a, another great book from, from, I, I guess it's now about 20 years old, uh, duty and obligation, uh, the Benjamin Friedman book, yeah. um, obligations and responsibilities. You, you talk about this a lot in, in, in that chapter, but also it, Thematically, I, I got a sense it, it, it weaves its way through uh, through the book. Um, could you unpack this this dichotomy, obligations versus responsibilities? Because it's a very, I think, key uh, a, a key section. 
Yeah, that was definitely, and yes, Dr. Benjamin Friedman of Blessed Memory was a, an inspiration, his writing. Um, and, and the thinking is that, you know, there's a philosophical debate between, you know, on the one hand, we believe in rights. Of course, we believe in human rights. And Judaism values the concept of human rights. I mean, that comes from being created but Selim Elohim, in the image of God, we believe that, you know, the exodus from Egypt was God's, you know, intervention in the world on behalf of human rights, justice, you know, the daughters of Tzalafchad, that's, a, you know, human rights. We believe in human rights. But Judaism is also so much about our responsibilities, our obligations, our duties in the world. And so there's this big philosophical debate, what comes first? Because there, there's a correlation between, you know, rights create obligations to live up, to, you know, to protect those rights and obligations create rights. You know, once you're obligated to do something, someone has the right to receive what you're giving. But the question is, which comes first if they're correlated? And there, there's a, a debate. There's rights based theories. There are some who argue that the main thing is everyone has their rights and we are just obligated to fulfill other people's rights. But many thinkers and those who I find most compelling, like Dr. Friedman, like Rabbi Sachs, and, and many, many others, argue that in, from a Jewish perspective, obligations come first. So if, I, if I'd give the example in the healthcare context, you know, um, if someone is injured or suffering in, in public, let's say, you could argue that they have a right to be saved. Someone falls in the street, they collapse in the middle of the street, and there's passerbyers, you know, bystanders walking by. Some could say, you know, who's going to save me? It's, it's my right. Come on. If someone has fallen down, someone's suffering. It's my right to be saved. But I think it, there's a stronger sense of, of societal um, camaraderie and, and mission when we say, no, the society has a responsibility to make sure that that person will be saved. It's my duty as, as a passerby when I'm walking by, it's my duty to save them. They do have a right, but they have a right because I have an obligation and the obligation comes first. I'm obligated to help people in need and therefore the person has a right to be saved. It's just a, it's just a firm, firm, more firm anchor to helping others when we anchor it in our obligations to them rather than our rights to receive them. So is there in your study? And, and again, this is a magnificently researched book and you, and you also do this every single day. Um, is there a basic fundamental ethic that informs the Jewish community uh, around medical ethics? Is there one bottom line that re that you could reduce all the text to? That's a great, very difficult question. I mean, because I can think, you know, just as you're asking the question, a few are popping into my head. I mean, I think one that I wrote about that I think probably would come first is love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, at the end of the day, our duty is based in our expectations of loving others, of kindness to others, of benevolence, of compassion to others. I mean, obviously the value of life and, and, um, you know, the importance of well-being and a whole person, you know, emotional, spiritual, physical. Um, but I think if I had to, if I had to narrow it down and I did write about this in a couple of chapters, um, loving one's neighbor is really the essence of what it's all about. So how does that translate into, again, the, the, the practical ethics of loving oneself vis-a-vis -vis, and you i'm sure you uh, i know you see this every day in the hospital um the obligation to extend life versus the responsibility uh to sometimes let go when you have to let go sure yeah i mean so i'll give you an example one one chapter i wrote about this in one area where you know, I hadn't seen a lot of writing and a lot of thinking on, but I'd face on a regular basis so that I wanted to research it is the issue of patients who are unrepresented, meaning patients who have no family, no, no one, and they can't speak for themselves. This often takes place with patients who are experiencing homelessness, often sometimes with people who are very elderly, um, uh, sometimes with mental health, uh, Strug people struggling with mental health, um, are, are people who are alone in the world and they en end up in the hospital with no family, no friends, no one to advocate for them. And we have to make decisions for them because they can't speak for themselves in certain situations. Um, sometimes they're not just unrepresented, they're unidentified. We don't even know their names. And we actually have um, a committee. It's called the Special Ethics Review Process, which I'm part of here at our hospital. It's led by our Center for Healthcare Ethics, but I participate in it. And um, our job is to advocate 
protect um, and make decisions on behalf of these patients. And so our argument is, you know, and what I wrote about is, you know, based on the obligation to love one's neighbor as themselves. So we have a duty to protect them, to care for them. They're very vulnerable to make careful decisions on their behalf to protect their lives, but also to make decisions in accordance with what we would want if we were in their shoes. Now, we can never really know what someone else would want. We do our best to uncover their values and who they are and how they lived and 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 speak on their behalf. But we are trying to decide based on what we would want as well, what the average person would want. And so there are times even though we usually err on the side of prolonging life since that's not reversible, some, something that's reversible versus something that's not reversible, meaning letting someone die who can't speak for themselves, you know, once they go, you, you can't change that. So oftentimes we err with these vulnerable patients on the side of prolonging their lives. But there are times when we recognize that they are experiencing intractable suffering. They're dying. It's not contributing to um, a possibility of recovery or any kind of long-term well-being. And that most people would rather not experience that pain and it's kind of um, inappropriate medical interventions anyways. And so even respect for them, loving them is allowing them to die comfortably. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you, which is the reason I wanted to, to raise this because they do have a whole chapter on uh, this unrepresented patient. We're seeing in our way in Jewish sacred aging, and this has come up a lot in the last, I'd say, couple of years, especially since the pandemic, this rise yeah. in our community of what the literature is calling solo agers. Uh-huh. Right. People have no family. They're all totally alone. Yeah. And a lot of times in a, in a class, they'll say, well, who's going to take care of me? I don't have a, a, a spouse. I don't have children. Um, I'm all alone. Who's going to make these decisions? I can't rely on a friend's because for all variety of reasons. So that's why Again, this is why the book is so very, very important, because this whole section on the unrepresented patient, I think, opens the door to a, a necessary dialogue within our community um, on, on a variety of different levels. The, the practical ethics, I want to go back to this, because this is why I think your book is going to have a, a, a great importance within our community. You, you talk a little bit about, I think you call the, the golden rule of self-experimentation. Yeah. Um, about clinical trials. And as we get older, and uh, I've just, I have some other people I was just talking to a a while ago. I want to go into a clinical trial. Can I do this? Do I put myself in danger? Talk to me a little bit about that section of the book. Yeah, that was, you know, there's a, there's a huge mural in our hospital in Cedar sinai here called um, the Jewish Contributions to Medicine. It was it was painted in the 1990s, a massive mural. And it always fascinated me, like why they chose about 40 different doctors, you know, starting with Moses, the first healer and kind of making its way actually to the future. It goes, it ends in the future. But um, one of the people on that mural is a Dr. Jesse Lazar. And he's actually the cover, the cover of the book. I, I took it from that mural. And um, Dr. Jesse Lazar um, was an American physician in the um, 18, born in the 1850s. And at that time, you know, um, in, in little ways into his career, there was a huge war, you know, in the 1890s in the United States where 6,000 troops died, 5,000 died from yellow fever. So the government realized we cannot sustain a uh, military if everyone's dying from illness. So they wanted, it, this is what encouraged them to do some research into how these um, diseases spread. And there was lots of different theories. Some said, you know, it's, it spreads through clothing or in the air. And Jesse Lazar had a theory that it had to do, there was some kind of particle or, or virus he, that was spread possibly through mosquitoes. And um, the problem was there was a lot of research happening in those days on very vulnerable populations, on native populations, on African-Americans, on slaves, you know, horrible ethical violations. And so there was this theory at that time that if you're going to experiment on others, you have to be willing to do that same experiment on yourself. And so Dr. Lazar, as he, what he did was he, he had tents and he, there's a picture of the tent on the cover of the book behind him. And he would put a person in the tent who he knew was infected with this um, virus. Well, they didn't know what a virus was at that time yet. He was the first one to discover it. And um, they would have a mosquito go in there and bite them. They would put the mosquito into a jar, take it to the next tent where a person who was healthy and let them get bit by the mosquito and see if they would get sick. 
And once he discovered that indeed this was happening, he uncovered the first virus. He was the first one to discover it. And he actually wrote a letter to his wife. We have the letter where he says, um, I believe I've made a, a huge medical um, innovation discovery. This is going to be in the history books and I'll see you in about two weeks. And after he wrote the letter, he said, okay, the last thing we have to do, do now is infect myself because this is the rule. So he goes into a tent, has himself bit by a mosquito and dies a week later from the illness. Oh, wow. He got sick. He got very sick and he died. He became known as the martyr to medicine. And the question that I wanted to deal with was, was that justifiable Jewishly? Can we put ourselves into risk for the sake of the broader community. It's one thing to risk yourself either for yourself, let's say a surgery that's dangerous, but it could save your life or for a loved one, for a family member. But what about risk for the community, the broader community, and maybe even won't even have an impact until the future. And I tried to argue basically based on the precedent of Queen Esther, that when Queen Esther was um, given the option to go and advocate on behalf of the Jews to her husband, the king, Ahasuerus, and she was very nervous to, she, Mordechai finally convinces her to, and she says, you know what, I'm going to do it, fast, and pray for me, and v'chasher avadati avadati. If I die, I die. And the rabbis say, you know what, she risked her life, but it was for the community, and therefore it's justifiable. Some others disagreed, and so we, I discussed it in the chapter, but I think that therefore you could justify and maybe even encourage people to in, in, put themselves into some level of risk for the sake of the broader good. And that goes also to a, um, there is a, a mood within our tradition of the, the greater good for the greater number, uh, the, the, the power of the community um, takes precedence in some cases over the individual. And so you yeah. extend that in the, in, in, in the book uh, about resource allocation, the allocation of scarce resources. We, we come up with this issue a lot in, our, in some of the classes and workshops that we do about what we call the economics of aging, which I'm, mm -hmm. you deal with every single day. So this is a very, very real issue. It's not in the luft, so to speak. I mean, this is right. practical and it's going to be wound up being argued in Congress with the debt ceiling soon uh, with yeah. these crazies down there. Talk to me a little bit about this section in the book about um, the allocation of resources um, in our contemporary world. Yeah, yeah, it's an important issue because what happens is, you know, there's oftentimes situations during pandemics, but not only during pandemics, all the time this comes up where we don't have enough. We have so many patients who have such a large need, but there is not enough resources to care for all the patients, whether that's not enough medications or vaccines or um, respirators, or it could be in many situations, not enough doctors, not enough nurses. Who do you treat first? Who do you prioritize? How do you um, properly care for everyone and save the most lives? And what's especially relevant here for us, you know, personally, you know, as a chaplain, as a rabbi, um, and from the Jewish tradition is that oftentimes you can make the decision um, on a primarily medical criteria, you know, save the most lives. Those who have best chance of survival um, should be saved. Those who are sickest, on the one hand, we prioritize those who are sickest, but not necessarily the very sickest, because sometimes we have to make a triage decision that if one person will take a tremendous amount of resources and a tremendous amount of time, but a few people will take a little bit less time, less resources, in, with our goal of saving the most lives possible, we might actually prioritize the sort of the second level of ill, the not, not the most severely sick, but the second level because there's a better chance of saving them. But what happens is once we've made those criteria from a medical criteria and we've determined, you know, who is going to be saved first, who's going to be saved second, who gets the resources first, oftentimes within those criteria, once we've kind of categorized everyone and scored them, there has to be tiebreakers. Because you can look at 10 patients, let's say, and say, okay, well, four of them fit into this category that we should be treating first, but we can only treat two of them right now. But four of them are tied for the exact same medical criteria for deserving care. So how do we choose who comes first? And this becomes, you know, a massive debate. For example, um, during the pandemic, one debate that happened a lot in, around the world was, should healthcare providers be prioritized? And the reason for the debate was, well, first of all, you're asking them to risk themselves by being on the front lines. And, and so why would they risk themselves if they didn't know that they would be cared for first? And second of all, we need them to be back onto the front lines so that we can care for those who are suffering. But others argued, 
well, you know, <laughs> that's not right because first of all, who are we to argue to, to say who, who's, who's on the real front lines? I mean, teachers, for example, shouldn't they be prioritized or the people that serve us food or, or work in the grocery stores? That's pretty essential. So this was a big debate. Our, our main, um, main pr- approach was, um, never to uh, give anyone priority based on, you know, um, wh- who they are or try to, try to give, you know, values, decisions to, to prioritize certain individuals. But at certain times, there could be instances where the needs of the many, if, so- if someone's needed by the many, that might give them some priority if all else is equal. Is it a correct statement that to say that I've, I've heard some people say in, in these types of conversations that there is some type of, you know, judgment, allocation, rationing, whatever the appropriate word is, that, that goes on on a regular basis just from the reality of having to deal with patients and the, and the, and the distribution of who gets what and where? Is that a true statement or sort of like a gray statement or a false obviously statement. we try not to let that happen and we're trying to be impartial and fair and just and everyone's treated equally and with equity but of course you know it comes up it, it's hard you know sometimes you see patients who you know we try to really avoid for example vip patients there was recently an article about a certain hospital in new york that um you know was was giving vip treatment in their emergency room to VIP patients. And that, that's a real ethical violation, right? But these issues come up and we try our best to, you know, avoid this kind of preferential treatment. And sometimes it comes up in the opposite direction, meaning someone, someone, a patient might have some kind of factor whereby the doctor is less inclined to treat them. You know, I'm thinking of an example that I heard once of a doctor tell me about a patient who they did CPR on and when they ripped the ch- shirt open, they found a, a swat stick tattooed on their chest. And I think many good people will be inclined to kind of not care for that person quite as much. But that's also not right. Really, ethically, it's not our place to determine which life is more important at that be- at the bedside, at that moment in the hospital. We have to treat everyone equally. And it can be a challenge, but it's really important. So is this also why your basic bottom line is the via hafta? Exactly. Exactly. So that, that, that's the linkage? Right. Right. Tr- trying to figure out, you know, the, that the, the, the essential love that we have for each person, the essential value of each person. I connect loving our neighbor as ourself also with the concept of Salam Elohim, of everyone being created in the image of God. Th- those two principles really work together in this way that we have to try to um, see the holiness in every person and treat them with that dignity. One of the great verses in the Torah that you talk about, um, Deuteronomy uh, 22, 2. Uh, the return of something that's lost, uh, and I mean, uh, which is one of the great proof texts uh, for healing and intervention, except for like that. Um, I want to ask you, uh, uh, and it goes to the question that you talk about about um, healthcare payment of healthcare. Uh, again, this is this practical ethics that your that your book is so strong on. And it, again, it is going to be a conversation that is going to continue in our country, in the United States, um, in increasing volume probably in, in the next couple of months. But we talk about, there's a passage in Deuteronomy also that talks about restoring that, but something that people lack, L-A-C-K, mm-hmm. lack. Do we have an obligation in your concept of medical ethics and in your bottom line of the Ve'a Hafta and Salam Elohim? Do we have a responsibility as a society to make sure that everybody has that equal access to a basic level of health care? Definitely. So, yeah, so I wrote a chapter about that in here because it's something that I was thinking about a lot. I'm not trying to get into politics at all. Um, and and I, I really shy away from that. I, you know, at the end of the day, I I give the theory and I say, you know, what, however you want to apply this, that different political parties can, you know, apply it differently. That's fine. But I think that it's just clear if you just step back and, and look at the writings throughout the generations that there is a, a value of universal health care of a kind of obligation upon a society or a bait din or community, however you want right. to say it, to make ensure that everyone within its community um, has health care provided for them. And I tried to make that argument based exactly on that verse that you're mentioning, because, you know, there's a big debate in the Jewish tradition about what verse in the Torah obligates health care from where are we obligated to treat the sick? And many people assume that it's this verse which says, you shall surely heal. 
Yeah, but that's Curtis actually Black. not, you know, that, that gives, you know, that's, that refers to, um, you know, malpractice or the, a doctor's right to be paid or, you know, even though God might cause someone to be sick, so to speak, we have, humans have the right to try to heal, things like that. But and there's other verses, but the rabbis ultimately say that the verse, Vashivot Allah, to shall return lost objects is the verse that obligates healthcare, just as you should return someone's lost object that they have lost, you have to return someone's health to them if they have right. lost their health, if they've lost their emotional, spiritual, physical health. And within those laws of returning lost objects, you find a fascinating um, number of kind of rulings that uh, that are very relevant for healthcare. And, and rabbis throughout the generations have mentioned them. So I just tried to put them all together. Like, for example, there, there's discussion about you know, even in addition to just returning lost objects, if something is lost, um, there's an obligation to create a protective barrier from impending floodwaters, even to one's neighbors. So this might kind of imply an obligation for preventative medicine. Also, the rabbis say that we can sometimes you can simply return the lost object to the place where the owner will likely be, not to put it into their hands, but bring it back at least to their place. So maybe this implies a certain sort of partnership in healthcare. Or there's a, the, the rabbis say that even if an animal constantly escapes, we must constantly be returned. So in other words, this implies to me that we can't just give up on non-compliant patients. We have to keep trying to, to help them. Um, if one causes another's animal to become lost, then they have a special responsibility to return it. So too, if you know there's some kind of uh, medical error, there might be some kind of special responsibility for the professional to rectify the situation. But my point is that from these this obligation to return lost objects, you see that it's an obligation to bring back to what someone has lost. So too, we can argue that there's an obligation upon society from a Jewish perspective to ensure um, basic health care access for everyone. Yeah, that's that. That verse is a it's a great verse, and the interpretations of that. Um it's a whole class unto itself. You could probably do a whole yeah. class just on that on that Deuteronomy verse. Maybe a you, semester, you, uh, at least. <laughs> you, you you talk about self care, which I thought was really interesting in in, the, in a book on on medical ethics. There's a there's a, a conversation about self care. Talk to me about how you wrote that on, and what's it the one fifth um, yeah one fifth rule. Yes, good point. So I was thinking, you know, as I'm writing the book and I, I was w worrying to myself a little bit, like, am I asking too much of people? You know, I'm talking about how much we're obligated and how many duties we have. And I'm really trying to make this a call to responsibility and encourage people to, you know, act and, and care for others. And, and in some ways, even selflessly, like the example of Dr. Jesse Lazar that I gave, you know, even if it cost him his life. And I started to think to myself, like, you know, if I'm, if, if I'm asking too much, I mean, it's not, it's not reasonable. It's not, there, there might, it might be pushing too far. Sometimes we have this concept, you know, to foster the Maruba low to foster. If you, you try to take too much, you just end up with nothing. And there is a, a value and an ethic within Judaism of self care. And especially, you know, as a chaplain, I'm oftentimes encouraging both myself and other chaplains that we have to care for ourselves with all the trauma that we witness, but also the staff that we work with and the patients and their families. And we're constantly encouraging others to care for themselves. And I thought to myself, I can't write a full book about responsibilities and ethics and duties without having a caveat at some point. Like there's also responsibility to yourself and there's also a limit to how far you expect it to go. And it's wild because within the Jewish tradition, there is even some questions that some ask and you find throughout the years is, which was, is a doctor even allowed to take a break? Why would that be a question? Cause some assumed when you look at the literature, it implies that the the extent of the responsibilities upon healthcare professionals, once they have those skills and are practicing medicine, that they're expected to be healing and caring for people at all costs. And if anyone is in need, they have to be there for them. And it, it's kind of um, extreme, you know, like they can't take a break. They can't have a vacation. They can't sleep at night. And, and it seems like that's what's expected. So I thought there has to be a limit to this. And I did find some suggestions, but I didn't find any that I found really compelling or um, like comprehensive. It was sort of like yeah, some, you know, minor suggestions here and there, just people saying like, well, of course they have to take a break. I mean, humans have to take a break. But I thought, but where's the kind of theory behind it? And so I wanted to come up with something and suggest the possibility that um, we know that just like the the Torah obligates giving a tenth maser, miser, of one's earnings, of one's profit to tzedakah, to charity, 
the rabbis limited that and said, When you give your charity, your one-tenth, it's great. If you want to even give more than one-tenth, you know, that's beautiful, but not too much, not more than a fifth, because then you're going to end up impoverished and you're going to be the one knocking on people's doors, begging for money. And we have to, you know, have a, some balance. Don't give too much. And that was financial. But throughout the generations, the rabbis um, began applying this to um, emotional areas. Um, they applied it, you know, to, uh, let's say an etrog. This was financial, but they applied it to an etrog. What if, um, what if, uh, the etrog is too expensive and I don't, I, let's say I have a thousand dollars to my name and an etrog costs $2,000. So the rabbis, the Shulchan Aruch says, don't get an etrog that, that year. You won't get one. So Rabbi Moshe Feinstein had a question, which was there was someone in a mental health facility. He was struggling and he was almost better. In fact, they said to him, you're almost done with our course of treatment. Just a few more weeks and you'll be ready to go home and reintegrate to society. Problem was, within those few weeks was Rosh Hashanah. And the person said, well, can I just leave for a few days for Rosh Hashanah to be with my synagogue for the holiday and to hear the shofar? And the doctor said, no, no, we're very strict about our treatment plan. You need to be here and do your entire course of treatment um, and all your group work and your individual work, you know, is a real serious mental health facility. And you, you, can't, you can't just leave for a couple of days. That's against our protocols. So he sent a letter to Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, one of the great rabbis of the generation at that time, saying, what do I do? Should I, maybe I should just leave altogether and leave AMA because I need to hear the shofar. So he wrote back and said, actually, for, for you to break your treatment for your mental health would be giving more than a fifth of yourself. And it's more important to engage in your treatment and miss out on hearing shofar that year. So you'll miss out. But it's because that would be giving more than a fifth. So rabbis began applying this to our mental health, to our emotional well-being. I started to think, well, this could apply, you know, in, in our every, in many areas of life. And I thought, you know, even for example, um, uh, if you, if you think about, um, healthcare professionals, just, just as an example, I wanted to give this like a real, um, uh, practical, uh, you know, quantify it. And I thought, you know, it, let's say someone works normally 50 hours a week. So I said, if we're going to apply this rule, so especially during, you know, difficult times, we need to make, you need to make a rule for yourself, or if even better, if your supervisor, your organization can make the rule that you cannot work more than 60 hours a week, because that would be more than going up more than a fifth. Like there has to be a limit. It's fine. Okay. Of course, sometimes there's a busy week or a busy week or two, but as a general rule, we say, we have to say, you know, you can't go more than a fifth over your regular or and even, even better. Let's say someone normally takes 14 days of vacation a year. They may not take less than 10. Right. To say you, you can't, cause that would be giving more than a fifth. You, you have to make sure to take some vacation. You have to make sure to have some pauses, some self care. This is a requirement of that one fifth rule. And I think it's important to apply it because otherwise it's very difficult to maintain this bioethic of responsibility if we don't also have some limits and some sense of compassion for ourselves. You know, thank you. The, the last two issues that, that we, were, we were discussing it reminds me of this there's a quote at the end of the book and i'll gonna run out of time but i want to i want to ask your just response the quote goes like this how we see the world and our role in it can have huge impact on decisions we make and our interactions with others unquote because this is a book uh, a case and covenant on 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 practical ethics can we then say, based upon the stuff we've had this conversation about, that Judaism is a, a civilization that does look in medical ethics in context, the context before us, the case before us, that we, that, that we are so, I'm going to use the word modern, but it's probably the wrong word, that the tradition is so understanding that it that there is no universal that we deal with each case as it comes up before us and we try to apply the best way of looking at that case within the context of our ethics and value system because it seems to me that that um, that that last quote that i just mentioned which is that towards the end of the book really affirms that could you respond to that yeah well said absolutely Th this book is really about articulating a perspective, an ethic, uh, an approach, and then recognizing that every situation is different. Every situation is unique. It's always case by case. But if we have a general principle, we can start to apply that 
in different varying cases and kind of see how when we plug in these values to each case, how they might bring out different ramifications and different approaches, but all based on the same sort of foundation. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it, it, it's, it reminds me of a formula that, that we use sometimes called value context choice. Uh, that you apply the value to the case before you and applying that value to the case will allow you to make an informed Jewish decision, even as, as you alluded to one of the cases before, the choice may be between bad and really bad. Rabbi Jason Weiner, um, author of Care and Covenant, I would imagine Jason now available, Barnes and Noble, the great God, Amazon. Um, <laughs> great, again, yes. to our Colleagues watching this or listening to this, the adult education people, uh, curriculum development people, take a look at this book because I think it's something that is very, very valuable to incorporate in uh, an educational situation, not only for adults, but also for young adults and teenagers. Um, they need to hear this. They need to study this and appreciate the tradition uh, that Rabbi Weiner has, has brilliantly researched. It's a, it's a great work. Uh, Jason, continue good luck and success at Cedar sinai uh, I, I really appreciate your time. I know you're very, very busy. So thank you very, very much. Uh, and again, good luck with this book. It's great. It's great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And best to you too. Thank you. Thank you. To all of you, thank you again for joining us on today's edition of Seekers of Meaning, the podcast arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. Again, to reach us with comments or suggestions, just email me at Rabbi Address at jewishsacredaging.com. Visit our website, jewishsacredaging.com. And if you'd like to make a, a donation to help support our work, there's a conveniently located donate button on the website and just follow the prompts. Uh, again, thank you. And a special shout out to our producer, Steve Lubetkin. And uh, this program is produced at the studios of Lubetkin Media here in beautiful South Jersey. To all of you, again, thank you. Until we see each other again, stay safe, stay healthy, and please be kind to one another. Thank you.